and welcome to Spaminar, our monthly online gathering for live theater prop professionals and anyone interested in stage props. I'm Ben Homan, SPAM member and props director at the Utah Shakespeare Festival. SPAM was formed in 1994 to create a fellowship among prop professionals to address issues of common importance and to create parity with other production areas. We're an association of professional prop educators and managers from not-for-profit producing organizations with an international communication and support network that shares resources, information, solutions, and techniques, as well as safety information, continuing education, and stock. We promote the highest professional standards among prop artisans and craftspeople and the field of props to potential props professionals. We're working to establish educational standards for the training of prop artisans. We now have over 150 members reaching from Hawaii to Ireland and Canada to Florida. As with previous Spaminars, we're requesting pay what you can donations to help support this programming and our annual grants for early career prop professionals. If you can afford to donate, the link will be in the chat during the session. We truly appreciate any help you can give. We have enabled live transcriptions for this event. If you'd like to use them, click on the live transcript button on the bottom and then select show subtitle. Alternatively, you can click view, view, view full transcript to see it in the meeting side panel. Tonight, Kirsten Harrison, co-author of the Fake Food Cookbook, will talk us through how to use various materials to create fake food that looks so good, it'll make you hungry. She'll share materials and resources with us, including an assortment of craft materials, from ones that can be found at the local craft store, to some higher end products that can be ordered from Roscoe and Smooth On. The PowerPoint she is sharing will be linked in the chat and sent out with the survey after the spam webinar. Kirsten is currently the technical director at the Cardinal Gibbons High School in Raleigh, North Carolina, where she shares her passion for theater and inspires the next generation of technicians. She received her master's degree at the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music in 2012, and has worked professionally at several regional theaters, including Playmakers Repertory Company, North Carolina Theater, Utah Shakespeare Festival, and Cincinnati Playhouse in the Park, before moving to education in 2014. Karen has also spent time in the world of film, where she worked in the art department on Susie's Hope and The Ultimate Life, two small feature films. She was also the author, along with Tamara Honesty, of the Fake Food Cookbook, Props You Can't Eat for Theater, Film, and TV. I'll be your moderator this evening. If you have questions, please put them in the chat and I will pose them to Kirsten during the Q&A following her presentation. Be sure to stay to the end to see if you are the winner of a copy of Kirsten's book, The Fake Food Cookbook, and to hear about our upcoming Spaminars and other ways you can interact with and learn from our membership. The winner of the book will be chosen randomly from everyone in attendance this evening. And with that, Kirsten, take it away. Hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Hopefully, yes. Um, so thank you again for having this opportunity to talk to you guys about uh, fake food uh, for uh, film, television, theater. Uh, that is the one of the pictures I took for the beginning of the, the front cover of the book. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about materials, tips and tricks, discuss projects from the book, and then I've got a couple of demo uh, videos that are linked in here and that you will also be able to see um, once the PowerPoint is sent to you. So materials, uh, high-end uh, materials vendors include Roscoe, Smooth On, Sculptural Arts. Um, coding is no longer in business um, due to the supply manufacturer change. Uh, so I'm really going to talk about to you about Roscoe and uh, Smooth On products, um, and I will start. So crystal gel uh, for sure is one of the top ones that I uh, like to use. Um, you can get it, what's really nice is it's a non-toxic water-based material which provides a clear plastic-like coating, um, dries to touch in one to eight hours. It depends on how thick of a um, coating you're doing on something. Uh, it does say to give it 24 hours fully uh, uh, you can also add a uh, cake flour to it to uh, thicken it up uh, to make uh, sauces and icings. Um, it will run you about $65 to $75 a gallon, uh, including shipping, depending on where you want to get it from. Flex Coat, which is a non-toxic water-based coating for um, foam. It is 100% um, acrylic, so you can... Uh, you can add it to, sorry, uh, you can uh, add it to a variety of objects um, and things. Uh, flex coat, it does not have any plastic in it, so it will not become brittle with age or exterior exposure, which is really great. Um, one thing I will say is that Roscoe is really great about creating these um, scenic sets 
um, which are going to run you about thirty-five seventy-five, um, uh, where you can get six ounce jars of the material, which is a nice kind of compact size, depending on where you're located, um, depending on what your budget is. Um, those are really cool. Uh, foam coat, uh, foam coat is a non-toxic uh, coating for styrofoam. Um, it's going to be hard and more durable. It's going to resist uh, cracks, chipping. Um, it can be sanded, uh, smooth, or carved to add detail. Uh, foam coat can be used again on a different uh, variety variety of uh, surfaces. Um, I use it on the in the project in the book on the the baked potato. I use it on the baked potato um, and some other props as well in the book. So those are high end. Crystal gel is definitely the one that I um, would go to all the time. That and sculptor coat. And since sculptor coat is no longer um, available, um, if you have a stockpile of it, fantastic. And if you can find a supplier that still has it then you definitely want to get it. Otherwise, um, crystal gel is going to be the next thing that you want to, to use. That's going to be a high-end uh, material. Um, the next is going to be um, Smooth On. Smooth On is another uh, company that I love to use. Um, in Casso K, which is the clear uh, rubber liquid, um, it's non-toxic. It's uh, resistant against UV. It cures without the, ge the generating dangerous heat or fumes, which is very important. Uh, minimal bubble entrapment um, cures perfectly clear, or it looks like water, or you can add tints to it um, using the um, Silipig uh, product that uh, Smooth On sends uh, that has that you can um, use equal parts A and B. That's what I really love about this stuff is that it's equal parts A to B, and you don't have to use a scale for it. Um, sometimes when you're trying to to mix things and you've got to get a scale can be a little bit tricky sometimes. Cure time is 16 to 24 hours. And that is also dependent on what you are, um, the application that you're putting it in and using additional heat can be added to about 60 degrees that can help speed up the cure time. But a heat gun is not going to be the answer or anything like that. Um, it can have a weird reaction to sulfur and may not fully cure. Now, what that is important is I did a, um, Seminar, uh, spam seminar uh, in person for a bunch of um, of the members, and one of the products I like to also use is Crayola uh, Model Magic. The problem with Model Magic is that it's got to cure, and that's got to be hard, fully um, dried before you're adding it into the Encapsule OK, because if you if you don't allow fully the Model Magic to fully um, dry out, it will actually uh, stop the Encapsule OK from curing. And you don't want that. Um, a trial size you can get on Amazon for about $35. Um, so that's really good. There are other options like the craft um, liquid water craft stuff that you can get at the um, craft stores. I don't like it as well because you do have to heat that up and it can get a little bit. Um, it's definitely more of that as a gel where this is just equal parts. And I'll show you in the demo um, exactly how to use that. And it's pretty user friendly. Um, which I'm, I enjoy. Flex Foam at three, which is the flexible. Uh, Smooth On does have a rigid um, hard foam that's called Foam It. Um, depends on the application that you are wanting to use if you want to do the rigid or you want to do the Flex It. Um, a key about this when you're using the Flex It foam, you must use a release agent. And usually they, they, they want you to use the Ease Release 2831 28, and the Universal Mold Release. And using them together, allows it to the, the foam doesn't fall. Now, sometimes, depending on what application you're doing, you may want the foam to fall. Um, when I was making the pancakes, which I'll talk about a little bit further into this presentation, uh, for sure, I wanted it to fall. And so I kind of manipulated the foam it while it was curing. But depending on if you don't want it to fall, you do need to use both releasing agents and you want to let it cure fully for um, 30 minutes before touching. Otherwise, it's going to decrease in size. The moment you take it out of the mold, it will decrease in size. And as it's still curing even further, which we also learned um, in the summer that I did that, uh, that seminar. Um, also depends on where you are located. The temperature and the humidity um, also play into to effect. Trial sizes. Trial sizes are available of all of this stuff, which is great. Um, I've used Flexit Foam It for 
breads and pastries and throw, throwable food props that will not break apart, um, depending on what the action is. Uh, Umu 25 slash 30 and Smooth uh, Cast 300 series, which is going to be the silicone rubber to make the mold. And it's going to be the liquid plastic that you can then make the hard um, casting of whatever. Um, Umu 25 is definitely a shorter amount of time where you have got um, 15 minutes to play pot life and then it's gonna cure in 75 minutes um, versus Umu, which you have 30 minutes, but it takes six hours to cure. Uh, you wanna use a release agent. Um, with a smooth cast, you have way less time. You've got three minutes to mix it, to get it what you want and then it dries and cures in 10 minutes, but it definitely gets hot. Uh, so you wanna be aware of that when you're using that product. Trial sizes of both of that stuff is available. Uh, you can get it on Amazon for about $45 for a trial size of the Umu 30 and the Smoothcast 300, excuse me, a combo set, um, which, so when I did this uh, project and this, this book, a lot of the stuff I used was the trial sizes because I was paying for it um, when, for the first part also, um, the book, 20 of these dishes I made for my graduate thesis. So when I was in grad school and didn't have a lot of money and the school was saying, hey, I'll, we'll give you X amount of money, I wanted to get the most I could get. And so the trial sizes of this product um, were really helpful and go a really long way, which is important. Um, so those are the high-end materials. Um, I definitely um, speak to both, to Brasco and to Smooth On products that I, I would vouch and I really, really like using them. And anytime I can figure out a way to use these products for the prop I want, I'm gonna use them. Um, but going to craft products that you can find, you know, locally, um, shellac again is always um, a number one thing I like to use because you can thin it with denatured alcohol and you can add leather dye to it and you can do, you can make French enamel varnishes. Um, it's great for sauces, adding pools of oil on top of pizza, the quiches, any sort of situ thing like that. Um, shellac can be super helpful. You can also, you know, add in sawdust to it or whatnot when you're trying to get texture on top of the turkey um, or any meat product. Uh, Design Master spray paints, those um, definitely... Uh, the glossy wood tone, the walnut wood tone, um, it's going to give it a little bit of a gloss um, finish to it. It has a five minute dry time again, but super important is that you use it in a well ventilated area. Um, it's great for adding texture, the cooked look to baked goods, um, all sorts of things. Liquid latex, low odor. Um, it's good for making skins on the cheeses and the meat products, which I will talk about uh, further on. Dry time, 10 to 15 minutes, but that depends on how thick you're making it. Um, all again, when you're, when you're doing each time you use these products, you're going to, you're going to see that dry time may be a little bit different than what this says. It just depends on the application that you're making. Great stuff. Super cheap. You can get it at a Lowe's Home Depot. Um, it's good. Uh, you know, you trim the wool in an hour. You can use it on some stuff. Um, can be, uh, you can stop expansion with dousing in water. You wear gloves because that stuff gets everywhere if you're not careful. Denatured alcohol can help with the cleanup. Um, great for baked goods. Spackle, lightweight spackle. You can use joint compound as well, but joint compound um, definitely has a grayer um, base color to it and it can crack and it can um, be, it can break up, which not necessarily is what you want. Like I, uh, uh, summer in Utah shakes, I had to make a uh, Great Expectations, a cake that was decaying. Joint compound was great for that. But if you're trying to do something, um, obviously, like if you're trying to do icing or whatnot, lightweight spackle um, or a milkshake would be fine with that. It spreads easily, light and fluffy, doesn't shrink or crack, water cleanup, dries quickly. Um, that's a huge, a huge thing. Um, that brand especially is super lightweight. Um, Alex Plus Cock. Again, water cleanup, 20 minute dry time if you get the fast. If you don't, then it takes a little bit longer. They have a 30 minute option as well. Uh, fully cures in about 24 hours, low odor, crack resistant. It won't shine through with paint. You can add paint to it actually. Um, it's great for icing and deviled eggs filling, um, which was something that I had to do. One of my first shows in grad school was picnic and there was definitely deviled eggs in that. Um, 
I talked a little bit about it earlier, um, Model Magic um, and how it interacts with Encaps OK. But Model Magic is great. It's non-toxic. It's economically priced. You know, you can paint and dye can be added to it before modeling or and molding. Um, dry time, 24 hours. Uh, 36 hours for complete hardness. And I would say if you are going to be putting it in something else, either a resin or um, in caps, okay, you definitely want to let it completely harden and dry. Um, it's not waterproof, but I use in the picture that you saw in the, the beginning, um, all of those vegetables on that vegetable tray uh, minus the broccoli because that was made out of fabric, but all the rest were made out of model magic um, and then painted and then sealed sort of deal. Um, the other really good craft product um, that some of you may already know how to use um, and have used is gel wax that heats it up on a burner um, in a heat resistant pan, heat, heat resistant pan, make sure that the counter that you're working on is um, heat resistant. You can use a thermometer to gauge heat to either decrease or increase the amount of bubbles depending on what the um, application that you're using. Cure time two to four hours, which is really great. Um, it can be removed from glassware or a silicone mold or um, anything like that. You can, it can be, once you've removed it from that, you can also, um, the glassware can be cleaned with denatured alcohol or, or goo gone will also get that stuff out of there. Um, you can add objects in that can withstand the heat as the gel cools. Um, it can be great for drinks, sauces, um, on top of the quiche, in the quiche, um, that's in the book, uh, is actually made out of uh, gel wax and creme wax and all that. It interacts with salt dough really well. Salt dough is another um, great cheap um, product that you can make with because it's flour and water and salt and you can, you know, get that stuff readily at the grocery store um, sort of deal. So those are the products um, that I use on the, on the regular, uh, depending on what the project calls for. Um, and it's definitely all the products. Some of the, most of these products you will see in the book um, in various projects. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is tips and tricks. So funny story is I don't like to cook real food. Um, my husband does all the real cooking, but I love to make fake food. Um, I love to look at real food uh, and see how they made it. And, um, and figure out what the application and go, how did they make that? And like you look at commercials and some of that food is not really, is not real food at all. Um, but what you really need to pay attention to is What's the application of the food? Is it for pro? Is it for photography? Is it film? For is it uh, theater? Because if it's depending on how close the audience is going to be, depends on how realistic you have to go. If you have, if you're in a black box setting um, or any theater, and the audience is literally like five feet away, well, that's going to, you've got to, the attention to detail has got to be even closer than if you're in a theater where people are, you know, 20 feet away sort of deal. Um, it just depends on the application and how far the audience is going to be from the, the actual piece. Another thing is the budget. What's the budget for the food prop? How long do you um, have to build it? Is this something that I was at in a rehearsal, you know, two days ago, and you've got to get that prop done? Um, or is it something that you're aware of that you can then, you know, you got a little bit of a lead time on? Uh, it depends on that. Um, how long is this supposed to hold up? Is this something that you are doing for the photography? Is it only going to be for, you know, a one day thing? Is it for a run of a show that's four to six to eight weeks? I mean, I spent uh, several summers out in Utah and that stuff has to last and it's, and it's, got to be able to withstand heat um, and being in rep and all that sort of situation. So you have to take that into consideration. Um, and also how much time, a big thing is how much you have to work with, like the budget for it. Um, because in Utah, one of the first shows I worked on was Cyrano and there was all those pastries and it was never, I don't, Ben never gave me a, uh, gave me a number to work with, but I knew I did not have like, you know, a hundred dollars or what to work with. So I knew I had very limited supply and what can I do? So, you know, we found a 
a bunt uh, pan. I put in some uh, paper towels with, uh, with um, crystal gel and put in there and then use great stuff to create the, the filling behind it and then painted it to look like that. That's something that you can do if you don't have the, the time or the money to do something um, more in depth or use flexit foam and stuff like that. There are other ways to do it. Um, how long are, how long is it supposed to hold up and how are you planning on storing these pieces after? If you are tossing them at the end, okay, that's one thing. But if you're trying to save them and you wanna keep them, all of the dishes that I made for the book, um, the first 20 and the second 20 that I made uh, to get the book published, all got put in, in um, the plug bags, airtight, and then put in storage bins that were labeled and such to keep mice or anything out of. And that's what you really wanna make sure that you're storing these things in temperature well um, areas. Uh, currently, most of the pieces from the book are actually stored in Rubbermaid containers up in the air handler room at, at where I work um, because it's out of hand, you know, it's easier to keep and know that it's all there. Um, be willing to understand that it may take more than one try with the materials, especially if this is something new that you're using. Um, it's going to take a little bit of trial and error to an experiment um, to figure out exactly, oh, you know, if I don't have exactly the right amount and it says it's A to B, but if I have a little bit of more B, will A still, you know, trigger the reaction? Usually yes, but not always. And you got to know that. Um, patient working on the lobster um, for the book because I wanted to cast a real lobster shell um, and have that and realized that it is incredibly brittle when you try to cast it and it's, it doesn't hold up well. And I got really frustrated um, and had to take some steps back um, and regroup. And even now, um, gosh, four years since the book, I would absolutely do it, change the whole way I did that and do it differently now. Um, location, temperature, humidity, um, altitude uh, is really important. Um, uh, and humidity, anything like that. Um, again, know that materials may not work for every application. Uh, be conscientious of allergies of your own and actors handling the prop, uh, food coloring or potential latex allergy. Um, I, once I were at Utah, I had to make, I think it was the pie for Serena or something. I was like, I'm gonna make a, make the filling basically a glaze over these fake uh, cherries out of poly um, acrylic and food coloring. I'm allergic to red dye 40. I was wearing gloves, I was doing everything I was supposed to, but I was walking across the prop shop to set it outside in hopes that it was gonna dry a little faster. And some other artisan came up to look at it and was like, hey, look at this, it's really cool. And then like it, it slightly ran into each other and it spilled on my arm and I actually had an allergic reaction. So you wanna be careful of that. Like, as I said, latex earlier, I, in the ribs, in the book, I added that to the bottom because to make it look as more realistic. But if, a, if an actor's holding in has a latex allergy, I would be, changed, I would be wary of, of trying to use any sort of product like that. Um, wear PPE when necessary. Be mindful of the, the safety daddy sheets on the products and be safe. Um, each time you use a material, you will learn something new. Uh, don't be afraid to get a little messy. Um, I definitely am not, I will wear whatever I was working on as soon as a moment I walk out or I like, well, you know, I just, that's okay. I, and I'm okay with that. Um, don't be afraid to get a little messy. You may find a cheaper option on Amazon. Um, but test before assuming that they will work the same as higher end products, because they may say, oh, you know, they cure in 24 hours or, or whatnot, um, but do they hold up strength wise? Do they tear easier? Do they take color or pigment the same way? Wood shavings from chop saw or table saws can be great addition to dishes to add texture, to be spices, to be um, grated Parmesan cheese, to be any sort of thing like that. Um, Things that you see around the shop that you're like, that needs to go in the trash. You never know, it could actually come in handy. Um, have a good selection of earth tones, neutral colored paints, 
crayons because that will um, be the colorant for gel wax. You don't have to use the special handy dandy color um, colorants for candles. There are a way to easily do it cheap. Uh, Roscoe sells those scenic uh, specific paint kits, which are really cool. Um, you used to be able to get the Roscoe um, you know, the tiny little jars, three ounce jars, and one and a half ounce jars of all of their colors of paints, which I think you can still get. But there's also now where I was talking about there's Roscoe scenic um, paint kits where they've got like primary colors, cool primaries, earth and wood, um, foliage. A lot of those, those umbers and the siennas um, are really, really super helpful um, when painting um, certain props. But you can also use all those, those tiny little bottles of paint that you get at craft stores as well. Um, have a variety of brushes including tiny detailed ones to one inch brushes. Um, having a selection of brushes is key. Um, but I think the biggest thing and why I even like fake food is to have fun. I began my whole exploration on fake food when I was an undergrad. And the first show I had to work on was Spitfire Grill. And all that stuff was, we had to do all the breakfast stuff. We had to do the pancakes and bacon and, um, eggs and you know the stick of butter as if they're, they're mixing stuff um, and I made all that stuff out of model magic um, and that was my first experience really with fake food um, and I loved it and then I think when I went away when I would always go to summer stock I'd always be like how do I make what show has to have fake food that summer um, and I always wanted to be the artisan to work on that um, and was very fortunate that I was able to and then when I went to grad school I continued that and I had to come up with some sort of thesis and that's, I picked fake food to be able to do it. Um, and All right, so we're gonna talk about products from the book. Um, the eggs and bacon were made from Flex Foam at three. And what I said earlier about how you can kind of manipulate and modify, I did the egg and the, the uh, pancakes because I kind of poked at it. I kind of moved the, the flex of foam as it was, it was curing. I only poured a tiny, tiny amount in and let it start to rise. And then I kind of uh, manipulated it in the uh, six inch uh, cake pan that I made it. Um, I didn't, and like I said, I didn't let it fully cure before I began to touch to allow the ends to curl on the eggs. Um, and, but I did learn a specific thing with the egg because I wanted the yolk to look super realistic. I used gel wax which is awesome, but if you'll notice with gel wax, like the color it will spread and will start to kind of dye whatever else you want. So you wanna make sure that the flex of foam it has been fully um, sealed. Um, you can put, you know, a layer of crystal gel, you can put, you know, um, any sort of the, the, the pl plastic varnish, a clear coat on it, um, and then put the egg yolk on and then cover it again. I chose to cover it again in a little bit of um, clear gel wax, but you could use um, any sort of, you could use a clear coat or something like that. But I wanted just a little bit, I wanted that, that sheen that gel wax is going to give. Um, the bacon was kind of a happy accident. I was um, using a heat gun with some plastic and I was like, huh, how do I get this to curl and do? And so curled it. Um, I then took Alex plus cock and covered both sides. Um, and then I just took shellac and FEVs and I just painted it to get to the, the texture that I wanted. Uh, as I said, pancakes, flexifoam it, but I kind of manipulated it as it was drying, um, painted them. The, the butter is just that moldable plastic that you can, beads that you can drop in water, heat it up, mold it, paint it, stuck it on. And then I used um, gel wax for the syrup uh, just because I wanted that. But you could use, you could use a lot of different products for that. I just really liked, when I tried to do, for some of these projects, I tried to keep it like, I'm going to use these three materials for this. I'm going to use these three for that. Um, sort of deal just depended on cheese platter um easily made from gel wax um that glossy wood tone uh, alex plus cock and some liquid latex will get you an easy way to do that i use ceramic bowls as the molds for the cheese drill bits 
Um, if you're trying to make a cheese platter or a chartreuse um, plate, this would be a great idea. Um, super cheap uh, products um, to go from there. So the cheese, uh, the chef salad. So this is really, I um, use crystal gel for this um, and I really liked it. Um, uh, paper towel, Roscoe crystal gel, uh, gel wax to make the egg, uh, fabric squares to make the uh, meats and cheeses um, and model magic to make the grape tomatoes that are in it. Um, lettuce was ripped by ripping paper towels. You can also cut out shapes of, of lettuce leaves, which I did in the video that you'll see the demo. Um, I just kind of cut them out and, and used uh, uh, crystal gel and mixed it um, and molded them. Um, and then painted them using, as you can see, different shades of green um, and umbers to get those different colors of lettuce um, and went from there. Shrimp cocktail. So this was one of the first ones that I used uh, the smooth cast from um, and casted something. Um, I got some shrimp and I made a mold of it using umu. Um, and then I casted it using the smooth cast, um, the glossy scotch tape for the tails. I probably would, and then I put some nail polish. I probably now would even probably make that a little bit different um, to, and then I melted the gel wax inside of the red color colorant um, and wood shaving flakes to get the kind of the look of um, uh, cocktail sauce. Um, that was really cool. You have to be careful when you're making molds of real food, especially like seafood. I think I had that was frozen, but if it takes, you know, six hours to cure, it's gonna start to smell a little bit. Um, whereas I would have used the Umu 25, which would have been way faster um, dry time um, in hindsight. I don't think I actually knew about the Umu 25 when I went to do this project, gosh, uh, almost 10 years ago um, when I originally did the shrimp cocktail. So again, as I'm talking, you can definitely tell each time you do this, um, and even now, 10 years after I, I did the original 20 dishes, um, you're always gonna learn something new and you're always gonna be willing to go, you know what, I, mean, I wanna change this. I'm gonna try something new and, and adapt and change, um, which I think is really cool about props and about fake food is that there is not one way to do it. And there's, uh, if you had to redo that prop again, you could totally change it up and change things about it. Um, corn on the cob and the ribs. Um, the corn on the cob was again, I made um, a mold of it and that's actually gel wax instead of smooth cast because I kind of just wanted the, I wanted the look um, better than the smooth cast. The ribs are uh, pink um, insulation for, foam that I carved um, the track for the bone. I casted a bone because I really wanted that hard plastic I shouldn't say hard plastic, but I wanted that hard bone. Um, so the bones are there. And then I use liquid latex on top and on the bottom and crystal gel and some paint to uh, make the sauce. And then of course, uh, glossy wood tone to help give the um, cooked um, look to it. Um, and those came out really, really well um, and was really, really happy with those. Uh, the pineapple upside down cake. This was a really cool kind of happy accident um, that occurred because you remember how I talked earlier about how you have to let it cure for the flexit foam it to cure for 30 minutes. I didn't. And so you actually kind of see in the picture, um, this side's a little higher than this side. Um, and I started to pull and I didn't use the ease release. Um, and actually, so the, so the first top layer bottom of that actually started to pull off, um, which worked out okay because I was gonna put the, um, the pineapples and the other stuff on top of it. But again, I learned something that you've got, you know, wait the time, be patient, um, give yourself some moments to allow it to fully uh, cure um, and then painted it. Um, I cast a dried pineapple because I didn't wanna deal with the moisture um, that the rings, um, we're going to occur after getting them out of a can. So I use dried, um, so they're gonna look a little bit different than those normal 
pineapple rings that you would see when you get from the can uh, at the store. Model Magic cherries. Um, I chose to do shellac um, and gel wax on top, which they find they react fine together. And then obviously glossy would turn around the edges and such like that to help give it the baked look um, of that. And then the lemonade, which is a caps okay. This is the first time I had used in caps okay. Um, and I will tell you what's great about Uncaps OK is let's say you run out and you don't have enough, which happened to me when I was making the lemonade, is that I had gotten halfway and realized I didn't have enough. And so I had to mix and continue to mix. And I made more and I was able to and you can layer it and you don't have a hard seam, provided that you mix it and you're pouring it uh, before those total 16 hours have um, having a lapse, then you're able to actually um, not have any layers um, and hard lines between the individual layers. Um, you can begin to allow the rubber to cure and then place your objects in, or you can place them at the beginning. It doesn't really matter. It just says it, it depends on what your overall um, look is going for. Um, and what's really cool is a lot of these, so these pops are still around. The, the shrimp cocktail, um, in the lemonade, I have a really good friend who's in LA um, and working as a costume designer. And she has this in her house. And she, every so often she sends me photos of this stuff. It's like, it's still going strong 10 years later, um, which is awesome. And I um, always appreciate getting those uh, pictures and those things of, of the props that are still holding up. I think there's props from when I was out in Utah that are still um, hanging around in the, in the prop storage. So if you make them right um, and you store them right, these things can last uh, quite a while, which is awesome. And pina colada. Pina colada is where I tested out adding stuff into Caps OK. Um, I had never really done into the mixture itself, um, and I added sawdust into it. Um, you can't really see in the picture, but if you Looking at it in the book, you're able to see it where you can actually see those, um, you can see the wood chips um, and it's easier and it's kind of cool to see and how it didn't, it didn't all settle to the bottom. It's actually all around, which is great. Um, but again, a reminder about the Model Magic, you want to let it dry. Um, a, the Model Magic is fully dried and I placed those in after the encapsulate had almost completely cured so that they would sit just right um at the top um and those are the the projects from the book um that i want to talk about there are many many dishes that are in the book that are really cool um you know that go from salto to go to using these products um to just kind of happy discoveries um that i found um so hopefully um, you know, whoever wins the book, um, I will sign it and send it to you. And that's, that's really cool. Um, the next thing I want to show is I did a little bit of a demo, uh, for Encaps OK, if you've never used Encaps OK. Um, so hopefully this will play. <laughs> if you'll notice here, um, right here, I am getting ready to start putting in the end caps. Okay. What I did is I actually, um, put a mark on the, um, actually I will go, everybody can see me. I'll actually do a live situation for it so that you can all see me since they did not come out. The video did not, but, um, Here's in caps, okay? For everybody comes in a little box like this, super cool. Um, you get A and B and get the Silipig um, colorants. So what you wanna do is I always like to draw a little line. I like to use clear cups because you can easily see how much of A and how much of B you have. You hate when you don't have enough and then you kind of hose in that regard. So I make a little line with a Sharpie, so I know. And then I'm gonna pour in, I get B. Okay. Now, the thing about the colorants, you gotta remember, this stuff goes a really long way. 
So you definitely don't need that much. And then I'm gonna pour A and B together and scrape the edges so that you get it all really in there. Okay, and then I'm gonna set that aside. And I'm gonna stir really well because you want it to be stirred. Stir, okay. I'm gonna put that back in that little cup. And then I'm gonna take the Scylla pig and I'm gonna be very careful. It's red and it will go everywhere if you're not careful. I'm gonna put it inside, okay? You want it and you're gonna stir super thick. Okay, and you, so you get the full colorant. Now, the key about this is that you wanna make sure that the colorant is completely um, dissolved and inside of it. Because if you don't, then when you go to pour it, the colorant will actually settle in a spot and you don't really want that. So then I've got that. So I wanna make purple or a grape lollipop. So I'm gonna take a little silicon red and a silicon of the blue. Dip it. Get a little bit of the blue in there. Okay, you don't need tons. We'll go back to, I'm just gonna, mix till I get whatever color you want. And again, so why I always say start with less is more with the colorant because it goes a long way. And if you've kind of screwed up and you've got too much colorant, well then you've got to start over and you've wasted material and no one likes to waste material. So you just you stir and you keep stirring. Make sure while you're stirring and you're cleaning up your work table at the same time because you don't want things to spill and get everywhere. You can come to your mold. So I've done this already where I had done it earlier, but I'll do it again to show you. So you stick it through this little, this is a silicone mold, so it'll be easier to come out at the end and you don't have to worry about a release agent. You got it. And then I'm just going to rotate and you can pour. Get it so it's all nice. And if you've done it right, you have very little material left over so that you don't have, you haven't wasted it. Now, if you'll notice in this trial size, I've only used about that much of it. And that's great because this goes a really long time way and I don't have tons left over or wasteful. And then 16 hours later, you'll get something like this, okay? Which is super flexible, great. Now, if you don't mix it well, and it's hard to see in this one, uh, but there's one here where the colorant did not settle fully. And in fact, then now you can actually see it color it. From a distance, no one's gonna see it. But for me, who's a super perfectionist, I would never put this on stage or go anywhere with it. It would just stay in the pile of things that, oh, it didn't work out. So you put it in the mold and you let it sit. And then 16 hours later, you would have what you want to. And actually the smaller amount, it didn't even take 16 hours. I did it last night at 8, 8, 8 p.m. And when I got up at 8.30 this morning, it had already cured and was ready to go because I was using such a small amount. So honestly, when you look at this stuff, it always says 16 hours to 28, four hours. It just depends on what you're doing. Um, so there, that is in caps okay. Um, I'm gonna do another demo because this video is probably not gonna have sound either. And I hate for you to have no sound. But the next thing I was gonna show is how to do the lettuce and the um, with crystal gel. So what I chose to do for the, the lettuce is I just use bounty paper towels. I drew some shapes of things on the paper towel. You don't necessarily have to do that. You can just kind of cut and or rip and tear. You know, it just depends on what size of material and what you're doing. A key is if you're having to make a large amount of something, then you need to make a lot to begin with. Um, and work your way. But from there, um, so great question. Uh, the mold is from, I just found this mold on Amazon. I would not put that popsicle in your mouth. Um, it's non, this stuff is non-toxic, but I'd hate for somebody to just kind of bite on it and then they took a piece out of that and then they got, you know, they have that in their mouth. I wouldn't choose to do that. If you're wanting to do 
um, something where they've got to put their put it in their mouth, and I would change it up um, and not do that um, sort of deal. So great question on that. Um, the Roscoe with crystal gel and the paper towels. I ripped the paper towels. I would get my crystal gel. I would open it up. I you can use wear you can wear gloves, but I am much more someone who I like to feel things and I like to touch things and I want to 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 do that. So I would get the paper towel. I dip it my fingers in crystal gel. I would shape the paper towel how I want it to be, and I would let it dry. And once you've got it dried, then you can start to paint. And they get crinkly and it dries. I did this around uh, 1 p.m. today, and these are already ready to go um, so that I could paint them. Um, I would advise, I quickly just kind of drew some lines. I wouldn't necessarily dry, draw lines. I would just cut the pieces, but you dip your fingers in it, you mold it, you crinkle it, to whatever shape that you want it to be. And then it comes time to paint. So I have some emerald green from uh, Sculptor Arts Coating, and I've got some raw in, uh, raw umber and raw sienna. And what I like to do is I like to put it out on like um, parchment paper, because then you can kind of create a little bit of a mixing palette right here. Um, I'm not sure if you can see it, but here is where I've started to kind of create. Um, a palette color, um, taking some emerald green, some raw umber, a little bit of raw sienna, mixing it up, and then painting the piece. Um, you can also get water involved and kind of help spread it a little bit. Um, but then you get pieces that kind of look like this. Um, and once you go, once you've got all those together, you can then put it together and it makes a um, makes the, the uh, chef salad sort of situation or side salad as this one is, but you'll see um, I use different colors um, because when you get lettuce from the grocery store, the field greens, none of them are actually all going to be perfectly green. There's gonna be some yellowing, there's gonna be some white parts in it. Um, and to get it as realistic as possible, you want the different shades and tones of green in there. Um, and that's how I used crystal gel with the lettuce. The lettuce that you saw underneath all of those uh, vegetables is also made the exact same way um, using crystal gel, molding it, um, and playing with it, and then painting it. The same with the, the um, little bit of lettuce wraps that are in the book. Same principle, same idea um, sort of deal. The last thing I will show you before I run out of time is when you are dealing with um, gel wax. Gel wax is great um, right here. Um, I like to get the small container. I've also got another mold right here um, where what's great about these molds is it pops out and you can push the stick out and then you've got the lollipop. I really like this because it's gonna give you the, the candy um, shininess look that lollipops do from when you get the grocery store. But be mindful that the gel wax, while it's curing, will uh, color the mold. So if that is super important, be aware of that um, while you're working. So when doing this, again, I like to take just, you know, lovely um, popsicle stick, and I like to kind of fold out and pull out exactly kind of how much I think it's gonna take to cover and I like to kind of put it in the mold so I know, okay, maybe it's gonna be about this much. Um, and then I put it in a pan. Um, I like these little small little pans um, in a one burner situation so that you've got, and you turn it on, you melt it. Um, I always like to put it on low um, and let it slowly start to melt because if you don't, the higher melting you go, the more bubbles you're gonna have. And if that's the look you want for like champagne, well, fantastic. But if it's not what you want for this application, then the lower temperature, allow it to slowly melt. Um, you can add crayon or colorant. I have tons of these uh, candle wax colorants that I use, but Crayola or those art um, crayons work just as well. You mix it up, get it to where the color is, and then you slowly pour on top, and then you let it set. What's great about the gel wax, obviously it cures way faster then uh, the Encapsoke is going to, 
But again, what's nice about being cast it's okay is I feel like it holds up uh, better um, to dust and other such. Um, when I've got a friend who has the hot chocolate from the book um, that has model magic like um, marshmallows in it. And she says she has to sometimes she has to go back and dust it because it will definitely get um, it will adhere dust and particles and stuff will adhere to it. Um, so if you're leaving it out for a long period of time, it becomes one of those collectible things that you have to um, dust every so often. Um, and those are kind of the demos, the videos um that this goes out with will actually have sound so i apologize about this um not playing with sound but what gets sent to you does have um sound and you can actually um look and see what i'm doing um, and stop it um at any time if you have questions about that um but that's my presentation um i know it was kind of fast um and i am ready for questions yes uh, so I I have a bunch. So okay. um, first, a couple questions on the lemonade. Is the lemonade heavy, that picture of lemonade? Um, it is heavy only because the glassware itself is super heavy. I picked a poor choice for the glassware itself, but the small lemonade is not heavy. And it, I've redone that one in a lighter weight uh, pitcher and definitely um, way lighter weight. Okay, and did you make the ice or did you buy ice? So I bought ice for that. I have actually made ice before, um, doing melting the beads and doing that all in the oven. Um, I just did not have enough um, beads to melt when I was doing that project. And so I ended up raiding the props area to get ice. Okay, and with that, how did you make the ice float? So again, how you do it is you let the, you let the encapsulate start to cure. So you've got to watch this. This is a project that if you're going to do, you need to have the entire day or do it at your house where you can, it, you know, in your own studio, because as it's starting to cure, place the ice, let it start to cure more, pour more in, put more ice in. Okay. Um, are there, are there times when you might choose to use a real food item? Like for the ribs, you said you cast a bone. But yeah would you use real bones so they were all slightly different or do you prefer to sort of make all I the, everything don't, safe? So I don't like using real bones from, so you could, I just, if I'm gonna, really what hit the ball was down to is when I was making the book, the big point was that we did not use real food in the book. So I had thought about using real bones and then the, the um, lovely people at Focal Press said, no, 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 it needs to be, um, it needs to be fake. So you could carve little pieces of wood. You could, you could cast little pieces of wood. You could, yeah, I mean, a bone. You could. There are a lot of options. Um, but when I went to do this and we talked to Focal Press, they really wanted me to use the products that were donated to me. And Smooth On and Roscoe donated a lot of the products that you see in this book. And so um, you have to do that. Okay. Um, how do you adhere, like? food to the plate. So once you've laid it out, like how do you keep it from sliding around or moving on the plate? Sure, so I, you can use super glue. If it's foam, you don't wanna use that. Um, you can use this, oh, I just I just used it yesterday. Um, you can use foam specific glue that's not gonna eat away at the foam. Um, you do not wanna use like, there's a lot of the, the super glue you're not gonna to wanna to use. Um, I don't really use hot glue a lot either. Um, but flex bond, you can use flex bond um, as well from Roscoe is a good product as I've, I've used that as a, as a adhering. Um, and I can actually send, I cannot think of the name of the foam glue that I literally used uh, Friday at school um, uh, to adhere stuff to, to adhere a turkey to a platter. So there is definitely tons of glue out there. Um, do you prefer like quality brushes or do you buy just like the cheap brushes because they don't last very long? I buy cheap brushes because I notoriously destroy brushes like it's my job. Okay. Um, do you almost always paint after you crystal gel or do you mix paint with crystal gel? It depends. So I usually do crystal gel and then I paint it because I like to see what crystal gel is going to do and then I paint it. Okay. personally but you can add paint in 
I've done it. Like if you do icings or such like that, I definitely you just add the paint in. But for the lettuce, I wasn't sure what it was going to do, so I painted it after. Okay. Um, have you ever had a prop job where almost all you did was fake food? Um, the summer that I, one of the summers I was in Utah, I'm pretty sure we, we knew that it was going to be mostly fake food. And you were like, well, Kirsten, there you go. There's your first four weeks right there, um, which I love. Um, I now, as a, as a technical director where I'm at, I definitely have to wear more hats than I often would. Um, and I miss just getting to actually just make fake food and props and stuff like that. Cool. Um, and do you have a favorite food prop ever that you've made? Oh, um, I'm super critical of myself um, and, the, and the work that I do. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't think so. I haven't made it yet. So yeah. Okay. And if there's one, one piece of advice you want people to take away from tonight, what is it? Um, food, food props are awesome. And if you can make, if you can figure out how to have fake food in your show, um, and make it do it. Cool. Well, thank you so much. I have a little bit of ending stuff here to do, including, um, uh, giving out the book. So thank you again, Kirsten, for a very fun and informative evening. Um, and now the winner of Kirsten's book, the fake food cookbook props you can't eat for theater, film, and TV is Jennifer Hare. So congratulations, Jennifer. Um, uh, Karen and Robbie will get a hold of you and get you get an address. Um, and um, Kirsten will sign the book for you and we'll get it sent to you. Um, uh, now it's time to get out your Sharpies and mark your calendars for our upcoming Spaminars. On October 17th, just in time for Halloween, Jen McClure, Properties Master for the Yale Repertory Theater will join us again. Um, to talk uh, with us more about Stage Blood. She did one last year around Halloween and we'll do it again. Someone just asked uh, where you can buy the book. Is it still on Amazon? It's on Amazon, it's on Focal Press, yeah. Yeah, so uh, just search for the title um, on your favorite seller and uh, it's a great book. I have a copy um, as well and we use it in our shop all the time. Um, our other upcoming seminar is November 14th. This will be wrapping up season one um, with Larry Heyman, assistant professor in properties design and fabrication at Oklahoma City University School of Theater. Um, he will be rejoining us to talk about set dressing and how it can make or break a, a, a show. Um, we'll also have Jay Lasnik um, uh, will also be joining us, um, who's been running these, uh, been in charge of the Spaminars for Spam for last year. Um, he's going to do a season one wrap up and also give us a sneak peek into season two, which will be starting in January of 2022. Um, if there's anything you would like to really see um, us present in season two, please let us know in the feedback survey, which will be sent to you. Um, um, and now um, you're probably wondering, uh, how do I become a member of this great group, SPAM? Um, it's been in the chat earlier, but if you're interested and you are a working prop manager, director, supervisor, master, or some similar title in a nonprofit theater or opera company, or an educator who teaches props classes or prepares students for careers in props, um, then please email our membership committee at membership at propmanagers.org. Um, we're also on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, links are all in the chat. Um, Spaminars are produced by the Society of Properties Artists and Managers. A special thanks to SPAM members Patrick Drone, uh, Ben Homan, Stacey Horn Harper, Nikki Kulis, Jay Lasnik, Amy Peter, and Karen Ruppy Vance, um, all who've worked um, this last year to make all these possible. Uh, thanks again for watching. Um, and once again, please keep your suggestions for future SPAMinars coming. We want to know what you want to learn about. Prop on, and we will see you next month. <laughs>